Hello and welcome back to Fintech Focus TV with me, Toby Babb. Today, I am absolutely delighted to introduce you all to Duncan Black from Field Fisher. Duncan, how are you? I'm good. Nice to talk with you. Likewise. Thanks ever so much for coming on the show. A first time for you uh, on it. And uh, we were um, recently sent some uh, some information over from the company talking about uh, your response to the Chancellor's uh, latest uh, vision for FS, which is something I think is really interesting at the moment. And it's uh, and it's great to see government to, yeah, the government being uh, so positive around financial services and and, uh, and fintech as a whole, particularly when it sort of collides with everything that's come through from the Khalifa report, creating this sort of opportunity, you know, you know, huge wealth of opportunity at the moment. So we're going to be looking at a few of the core themes, uh, you know, fr from the uh, the Chancellor's Chancellor's recent recent vision. Vision, easy for me to say. Um, before that, and before we go into it, Duncan, can you give us a bit of background about yourself and the company as well, please? Sure. So I'm a, a solicitor in a city law firm. And I specialise in financial regulation with my team. Our big office is in London, but we also have offices in other parts of the UK and in, in Western Europe and further afield. The kind of work I do is for all kinds of financial services businesses. So it would be banks, brokers, hedge funds, other kinds of funds. We see businesses in all shapes and sizes. And we also have a very strong technology practice so inevitably we see a lot of uh, new fintech ideas coming through and the area i guess is probably going to be more interesting for your viewers is that crossover between financial technology and regulation and how those two work hand in hand so i think they, as certainly, you were saying, they certainly have been haven't they as well over the, the course of yeah the i mean i think that i mean pe people commonly complain that they say that um, regulation hasn't kept up with the pace of technical change and I mean that's true in every sector in aviation and food and uh, non-recreational cannabis and anything you want to mention that that's always the challenge for regulators what's interesting as you were saying in your little uh, introduction there is finally uh, the government is focusing on financial services as part of the post-Brexit agenda there's been a lot of comment about the fact that the government has been interested in things like fishing or sausages going to Northern Ireland and all that kind of stuff. And what, what, what about the financial sausage, sausage services, wars, yeah, yeah. <laughs> which probably contributes a little bit more than, than either of those two areas to, to, <laughs> to, to the tax revenues of the country. Um, so it'd be interesting to talk about that at a very high level, just on the sort of philosophical point about well, what, what can governments and regulators do? to try and make life a bit easier uh, for yeah, people absolutely. with interesting new ideas and regulatory concepts. So actually, can governments do anything? Can they do yeah. anything positive? And we will, we can talk about that. And then we can get into some, some of the more detailed areas. Um, I'll move to you, Toby, how you want to steer it. Absolutely. Let, let's let's start on that because, because look, I think it's it's been very much a, a theme of the last five years of, of, of the government, really looking at how they can boost competitiveness and seeing... Uh, the sort of jewel in the crown of the financial services market, you know, particularly around Brexit and everything that's happened around there to make it competitive for, for companies to want to work in uh, the UK as a hub. And I think you know, Brexit has potentially put some, uh, put some pressure on that. Uh, you've seen New York as, as traditionally the other, other thing, but a lot of emerging com uh, countries who, who are uh, looking to compete with that as well. Uh, he mentioned closer links with advanced and emerging financial centres uh, all, all over the world to sort of... Uh, collaborate with that before which seems to me to be a, a sensible option but with regards to you know, I think one of the things that's been particularly attractive to businesses and why you know London's found itself such a hotbed for fintech businesses has been the uh, you know the the attitude towards regulation and tax that's your sweet spot tell us a little bit about um about how you know the UK can keep that sort of position despite you know the, you know, the pandemic the, you know the, the the Brexit situation, the whole global uh, you know financial services world, and everything we're seeing change at the moment within it. How can how can the government maintain that sort of uh, competitiveness? So the, there's two aspects to this. There's the government and there's the regulators. In fact, there's a bit of an issue at the moment about the extent to which the government should direct or even interfere with yeah. what the regulators say or do. If we deal first with regulators, I mean the FCA has always presented itself as being very positive about new ways of doing business and new ideas. So a long time ago, it started up something called the Regulatory Sandbox, which was a way of testing new ways of doing business. 
The big issue was that the UK had to play by EU rules up until Brexit. Although that said, the UK was at the forefront in designing those rules. And when you obviously within the European Union, you've got a multitude of different attitudes. There are many member states which don't, don't give really much thought at all to financial services. Then there are member states which see uh, an economic advantage in one area and want to promote a particular type of business because they think it's going to improve tax revenues and you know bring up their financial standing. And then there are the bigger states like Germany and the UK and so on, which come at it um, from a much more developed point of view about, well, what, what's our attitude? So to try to meld all those attitudes into one EU rule book has always been super difficult. And that's why you, we ended up with the MIFID II as a good example of a piece of regulation which is incredibly detailed and complicated. And inevitably, there are bits of it which are seen as holding back uh, business. So what the FCA tried to do is say, within that overall framework, we're trying to uh, make things as positive as we possibly can for those businesses which are developing new technology and which are doing interesting new things. That's one side of it. Second side of it is if you want to start a new business with a new business idea, you obviously need capital, you need financial backers. And you, you have the question, well, where, where do I want to uh, have the base of my business? Do I want it in the UK? Do I want it in Estonia? Do I want it offshore? Where's the best place? And there'll be a variety of factors which will influence your decision. So some, some businesses want to go to a place where there is as little regulation as possible. Uh, because it makes life easier for them in the, in the startup phase. The difficulty with that is that when they mature as businesses and they want to attract more investment and kind of be seen as a bit more adult, it's not always great to be seen to be located in a part of the world where there is very little financial regulation or maturity of markets. So mm -hmm. you have to strike that compromise on what am I going to do? Then the third point is the government. So the government's attitude is fundamentally it wants to raise tax, but being brutal about it, that, that's what it wants to do. So it wants to see a vibrant economy, giving lots of employment, but also generating tax revenues. So what it wants to do is to provide a framework where people can come and raise money um, to start their businesses and operate in a way which isn't going to offend the, the criminal law or do anything like that or rip off investors or do those kinds of things and do it in a way that um, is attractive to investors who are deciding, well, do I do this in New York? Do I do this in Monaco? Do I do this in, in London? So with the, with the Rishi Sunak speech, what, what you see is a kind of a manifesto about how the government, and it's, and it's long awaited, what, what is the government's posture now, as, we, as you said earlier, well, as we come out of the pandemic and as we settle into life after Brexit, what is this all looking like? And the background to his speech included the track record so far in our dealings with the EU and, mm -hmm. and where that was going to go. So before Brexit, there was a question mark over, well, are we kind of going to play by EU rules but just exist outside the EU and see where we go with that? But that was one possibility, but it did rather depend upon the EU reciprocating and saying, yeah, we're fine with that. Um, you, you can sort of play alongside us and we won't, we won't through too many obstacles in your way. What's transpired is that there's been relatively little reciprocation and interest from the EU in going down that road. Um, the approach appears to have been, and again, it's difficult to say what the harmonised approach is because everyone has their own little self-interest. And you've got within the EU member states competing against each other for the for the crumbs that drop off the London table, if I can put it that way. So you've got Frank, the Paris, Amsterdam, Dublin, all these places hoping to pick up business. Uh, which which will migrate away from London. So they're not actually yeah. acting with a common purpose. The, the posture that they've adopted is one where they're not madly interested in making life easy. And we see that in a parallel sector, which is um, in relation to the recognition of judgments of courts. There mm. was a question about whether would, would the EU um, be positive about the UK joining a, uh, an enforcement of judgments convention called the Lugano Convention. And the answer has come back basically, no, we, we don't want to do that. So that's saying, okay, uh, on your bike, you, you go on your way. So that's kind of, and, the, and that's reflected in Sunak's speech. We're, mm. we're now, we're the kind of had that decision made for us. We, it's quite clear to us 
that we need to be looking above the EU and other other places will come on to the US, Singapore, Switzerland, those kinds of places. But that's the setting for the government policy. And then it comes back down to the regulator. And what do you do about issues like cryptocurrency or something like that? Absolutely, yeah. Which we've seen an enormous amount of uh, noise noise about, and, and the, the classic sort of crypto undulation at various different different phases. It, it's going through the roof. It's dropping off a cliff, and and uh, we've seen you know, governments adopt it. We've seen uh, you know banks finally sort of uh, you know, uh, lay, lay their uh, stake in the grounds with regards to crypto and everything, and, and it looking like a, you know, a lot more adoption. Tell us a little bit about how how crypto muddies the waters in all of this. So. The, the, the point about crypto is, and, and no one can really get away from this, it's attractive because it's anonymous. Mm. And if it's anonymous, it's going to be attractive to people who want to break the law. Um, so, you, I mean, you might have read in the last few days these um, ransomware hackers. Uh, how do they want their ransom paid? In crypto, thank you very much. So, yeah. you, you know, if, if, you, if you have a, a way of exchanging money that, that, I mean, crypto is derived from the Greek word for secret, and, and that's the point of it. So you can see why a regulator or law enforcement would be a bit cagey about the idea of crypto and the whole attraction of it. And the way the UK has approached this is that there's very little regulation in the sense of regulating the, the particular kinds of crypto tokens or anything like that. But, but the way the SEA has stranglehold is probably too strong a word, but certainly really brought it to heel, is by saying that if you want to engage in most types of crypto business, you have to have an anti-money laundering registration with the Financial Conduct Authority. And so far, only five crypto businesses have got one of those. And, and you'll have seen, you know, very recently, a lot of these crypto businesses have either been refused or withdrawn their applications. So it makes it incredibly difficult if you want to trade lawfully in the UK in any kind of crypto, because you, you need that AML approval. And because mm. of the nature of crypto, getting that AML crypto is really difficult. I mean, I, I must admit, I, I can see why people are interested in crypto, because there is the possibility of making a huge amount of money very quickly. I, I can see why people would be interested in that. There's also a world-class opportunity to lose vast amounts of <laughs> Absolutely. In crypto. So it's quite a, quite a hot potato. And I suppose one reason why it's especially popular is there aren't that many other places to put your money at the moment. I mean, interest yeah. rates are incredibly low. So what are you left with? Equities, okay, fine, but you know, you know, go so far piling into those, and that's why that's why people do it. Uh, so I think it's a huge, it's a huge issue. And at the moment, I'm struggling to see how crypto is going to have a sort of long term future as a what, what would I respectable is not the right word, but as a sort of mainstream asset class. It, it's yeah. fine, to, you know, if you fancy a punt on something. That's great, but it but it's it's difficult to see how it will ever really migrate from that into something like an equity or a guilt or something of that nature. And there remains this sort of clamour for you know for for that to happen in some areas. And I think it's quite interesting to see. Look, we, we've been uh, focusing this series on on opportunity and growth uh, in the marketplace, fast growth opportunities, and you know probably no faster growth has been seen than, than uh, some crypto company crypto companies by the same token. Excuse the pun. By the same token, uh, we've also seen a number of uh, companies there who've who've uh, fallen backwards at equal rate with, you know, within this. So, so it remains uh, interestingly and fascinatingly volatile. So when when you look at at uh, you know the, the government's vision for for the financial services, and you say there it's difficult to see it you know break through as as a a mainstay asset class, where do you think opportunities really lie in this, and what are you, what are you seeing in that space? In, in crypto, are you thinking? Of, Absolutely, or, yeah, yeah. Or more generally? Well, I think it, it's in there. Fact, I'll, give you, I'll, give you, I'll give you both of those. Let's start with crypto and then let's go more generally. Okay. Well, I mean, so far as crypto goes, I mean, I think there is a place for something like that. There's always been a place for a very risky, volatile asset, uh, so long as everybody knows that's what it is. The added problem with it is it's not only risky and volatile, it's attractive to criminals, and and the difficulty is on the AML side. Maybe we should just spend a moment talking about anti-money laundering. Yeah, sure. The thing is that the expansion of 
of the digital delivery of financial services. It, it's terrific for one sector of the population, which is young, younger age groups, which are happy doing their banking on their phones and all the rest of it. But it excludes a lot of older people, certainly people in their 70s and 80s, large number of whom are not comfortable with that technology or who don't have it at all. And, and then you add to that problem the ease with which people who want to defraud uh, customers can, can get in on that. It is a massive problem, which I don't think has been particularly successfully addressed. And then allied with that is the whole burden of anti-money laundering checks. So the, the policy response to this kind of thing, to people layering you know, criminal proceeds and money and all the rest of it, is to make anti-money laundering checks more and more stringent every time. Um, but I think a point has been reached where the law-abiding part of the population and, and the service providers are having to spend so much time dealing with anti-money laundering checks for not much win, if I can call it, not much bang for the buck. And the non-law-abiding side of the population is quite capable of, of getting up to no good outside that sphere. So we saw that, for example, with COVID loans and the bounce-back loans, and there are some pretty hair-raising numbers being thrown around as the level of fraud which is going on with that because of the mm. great difficulty in establishing the identity of the person you're dealing with if you're dealing with them remotely. Now one of the very interesting things which the Khalifa review and, and was touched on briefly by, by Rishi Sunak was the idea of having a common digital identity which I think is a really good idea because at the moment what you have, if anyone of you have tried to open a new bank account or do anything like that, you will have to go through the same set of money laundering checks that you did last time around when you opened, when you took out an insurance policy or did that. So you're having repeatedly to do that and yeah. present your identity in a very old fashioned way, which is a photocopy of a passport, which has been certified as being true. It's, it's amazingly prehistoric almost. And it's yeah. puzzling yeah, yeah. to me that that, that that's still being done. It, there must be a better way of rapidly establishing that you are who you say you are to cut out all of that. And I would have said that ought to be a really high priority for every financial services business because that would have just straight eliminate a lot of the fraud that's going on at the moment. Yeah, yeah. and there's definitely innovation that's happening in that space, isn't it? But you're right, it is, it is, it is very, very interesting. Is that? Every every time I go out to my New York office, I'm always surprised about the sort of uh, infrastructure out there and the lack of development over a period on things there that can move very very quickly. And I think over here, when you think about that sort that sort of stuff and and the the general innovation outside of you know the financial services that's happening, there's definitely petrol to put pour on the bonfire within it. I, I want to go back to to um yeah the, the uh, um Khalifa review and 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 talk a little bit more about there. We we um the chance of speaking about sort of really adopting cutting edge technology and and uh, and pushing into a lot of the recommendations that remain remain from the view what's your take there and what where, where are opportunities within that well i think a very interesting idea is is the idea of um the bank of england and other central banks introducing their own digital currencies uh, i think mm. that that will also be immensely beneficial and just to be clear you know a bank, a central bank digital currency is the total opposite of cryptocurrency. It's centralized, it's identifiable, transactions are traced, it's backed by a government, it's everything that crypto isn't. Yeah. And why that's a good thing um, from a business perspective is it will speed up payments. Um, you won't have to deal with clearing houses and stuff like that. Yeah. So that's that's very good. It also makes it very difficult to be fraudulent because all the transactions are traceable. So people might have this situation where they're being ripped off and cloned websites and all the rest of it. The reason why um, governments and banks are a little bit nervous about it is because if it's too successful, it takes away the fiscal power of a bank because one of and therefore a government because one of the one of the ways as we saw during the whole Brexit debate that a a country kind of measures or values its sovereignty as if it has fiscal control. It can determine the value of its own currency. And that's one of the reasons why we didn't join the euro 20 years ago, because you surrendered that power to, to a non-national 
a rule maker about well, how much is the euro going to be worth? If you introduce a central digital currency, there's the possibility that it stops being tied to any particular country and people will just pay each other in, in dollars, basically, but that issued by the US. And so the banks just stand back and watch people trade. And then, then it takes off and there's no going back once that's done. Once people see how attractive that is, if you, if you ask him for a prediction, what will life look like in 50 years time? I, I think that the, um, the temptation, the benefits of that are so high, I, th- I can foresee that coming in. Because I think that there's, there are also benefits for governments, as I say, because it'd be very difficult to evade tax, for example, because if you're paying your tax and you're receiving your income in a centralised digital currency, it's impossible to, to not declare what you've earned because everything yeah. is, is monitored. Yeah. So, so I would say that's a very interesting area. Um, I mean, other areas that came up in in Sunak's speech, which, which which aren't new, and this whole question of green guilt and um, socially responsible investing and, and all that yeah. stuff. Let, let's should we talk about that? For a Abs- absolutely. I think that's been one of the sort of core themes that we've been uh, hearing about, and where, where we're seeing a lot of movement around as well at the moment. You're seeing the same thing, right? Yeah. I mean, pe- people are people are talking about it. I mean, there is there is a lot of policy direction on this requiring disclosure of um, how green are you, and and there's a sort of there's a technical problem with that because everybody presents their green credentials in a very kind of unstructured, unregulated way, and and people use words with, without actually defining what they mean, and I think that's because pe- people are still unclear actually what what is socially responsible or what is green. We take take an obvious example: hybrid cars, self self, you know, um, generating engines and stuff like that. the The truth is about those; they're not actually that environmentally friendly to make or to recycle at the end of their use. They're they're very good in the middle stage of their lives because they don't emit carbon dioxide and nitrous oxide. But yeah. either end of their life, it's a slightly different story. So. You know, and and go back twenty years. It's the same with diesel. They said, "Oh, you know, diesel's great because there's no carbon dioxide." Well, it's true. But there's plenty of other things to come out, yeah, yeah, yeah. which we now start to realise. So terms and conditions it, apply. It, well, they do, and I think people start this kind of stuff with the very best of intentions, and then realise that actually there are always consequences. If you're going to say, "Okay, well, no more coal, or no more petrol." That, that's all fine, but what do you replace it with? Answer batteries with all kinds of horrible things inside them, which are difficult to recycle. So that then translates itself into a financial regulatory space. Well, how are you going to accurately describe how green is your investment? And that's the issue with all of this stuff. So if the government issues green gilts, which is just government borrowing, but earmarked towards so-called green projects, there has to be some way of accurately describing how green that project is and what the environmental or social benefit of it is so that that's the sort of starting point of the discussion and then the second thing is yeah it's it's a popular uh, way to try and sell stuff but it doesn't always go to plan so i mean there have been some recent examples of, of investment opportunities which have nailed their flag very firmly to the green mass which have not not sold particularly well and it's interesting to understand why that might be. Is that they weren't very well described, or the appetite has just waned for that kind of stuff, or that the reality of the situation is people want a return on their investment, and you know they they want to make money. The green is nice, but making money is the most important thing. You know, the, all governments correctly have to say, yeah, we want to you know go for renewable energy and we want to invest in, and do all these marvelous things there are consequences and there are costs associated with doing that which have to be fairly described to investors i think there's a there's an under understated element around that about the cost isn't there and and, yeah. uh, and, and what is always important because you know there, there are you know there's, there's natural benefits to what we're talking about with regards to the whole esg piece the, the narrative can definitely be made there to say that it does you know increase uh, top line revenue and, and such like as well but it's also it, you know that, that there's narratives to to counter that as well at the same sort of time. It's going to be very very interesting. So look, there's a huge scale of growth and opportunity within that that area and that sector, and we're seeing companies advance very very rapidly in in the space. The longevity uh, of, of where it heads, I think, is quite an interesting area to look at, and uh, and how that scales that you know there afterwards. Can we move on to to um, just looking at the this, this uh, emerging finance? We've spoken to people all over the world on this show over the course of the last year. Mm-hmm. Um, including 
heavily invested uh, you know, fintech hubs and, and, and areas of, of uh, innovation and growth in Israel, Malaysia, various other, uh, you know, other, other areas all around the uh, world. You've mentioned some of them yourself as well. I know that uh, the chance is looking to, to uh, forge closer links with this. And there's been the charm offensive that we've seen all the way through government over the course of the last year or so. And, and, you know, and particularly post-Brexit, when we look at you know, the financial centres centers of Europe and then also you know, the states, et cetera. You know, et cetera. And uh, um, you know, I, I think it was quite uh, interesting to look at this, this sort of uh, firming up of relations between uh, Biden and Boris in various stages as well. Tell me a little bit about what you're seeing there and what your, uh, your anticipations of, of, uh, of how we can improve those relationships and increase those links and, and what that means for the sector as well. Yeah, well, I think that now, now the direction of travel post-Brexit has been set, that the centralised view of the EU is not to be massively warm or receptive to the idea of cooperation with the UK. It's inevitable that we will start to see closer links forged with countries like Switzerland, for example. Mm. So an interesting story that you may have seen recently, there was a brief period where the value of equities traded was higher in Amsterdam than it was in London for a short period, and people were saying, there you go, that's that's the beginning of the trend. We're going to see more of that. Well, that's now changed back again. So London is now back ahead of Amsterdam, not as high as London used to be. Um, and, and in any event, it wasn't a massively significant point because all it was saying was that the value of the trades booked through entities in Amsterdam was, was higher, whereas the, the, the place where the decisions, the investment decisions were made, hadn't changed. And probably speaking, that was London or, or New York or somewhere like that. But the reason why London got back into the lead again is because we finalised a reciprocal agreement with Switzerland, which, as you know, is not part of the EU. So yeah, yeah. Switzerland yeah. has always been, well, I say always since since the war, has been a very important financial centre of banking and insurance in particular. Definitely. Yeah. Um, and um, those are the kinds of countries that we now have an opportunity to get closer to, well-established financial centres like that, and the financial centres which have been around perhaps less long than Switzerland, but which are well on their way, like Singapore. And Singapore is an interesting one because Singapore and Hong Kong are in the same time zone. And Hong Kong has traditionally been very strong um, because well, when it was obviously uh, under indirect UK rule, it had you know UK common law and courts and businesses like that. They want certainty in relation to their legal disputes and they want the confidence to know that no government's going to jump in and interfere with their property rights. That was a major selling point for Hong Kong and the other big selling point for Hong Kong is it is the gateway to China and people still want Absolutely. to invest in China and they always will do. Now, Singapore has has tried to improve its offering and it's succeeded. It's it's an attractive place for people to live and work. Um, it's it's a stable place. It, you know, it has uh, a good system of law, which again is quite similar to, to, to the UK and US systems, which businesses tend to favor. So it makes perfect sense uh, for us to try to get closer to places like that. I wouldn't know the state, um, what, what's happened recently with Singapore. It's just it's just an agreement to cooperate. It's a memorandum of understanding. It's nothing more than that. But it sets the direction of travel in the way that I agree uh, we should be doing. That's not to say we, we won't still want to do business with Hong Kong or China or all these other places. I mean, you can never control where businesses or markets want to go. And, and my view about government intervention, this is a very high level point, is that it's a bit like the Hippocratic Oath, which doctors take, which is to do no harm. You might think a doctor's oath is to cure someone. Well, that's that's not always possible. But what you must don't make it worse. Do, yeah, don't make it any worse, um, which which, of course, doctors used to do up to about 100 years ago with all the various interesting methods. So and I think that's the same for governments. Just just leave people to get on with it and don't make things worse. I mean, you do have to control making capitalism and markets to a degree. And that's yeah. what law does. Um, but allow businesses to cooperate in a way that's consistent with the other values of the country. So that's why things can become problematic when the UK is considering, well, what level of business cooperation does it want to have with other um, nations which don't have the same, uh, for example, human rights outlook? I mean, where, where do you draw the line with that kind of stuff? And that's always going to be an issue. Yeah, yeah, Duncan. To 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 tie tie this up, look, I think there's um been a fan of what the uh, the government has done for some time in in regards to uh, creating London as a as a, a financial capital. I think it's been doing a great job for for you know a decade at least in in terms of ensuring that's happened. I think there's some interesting waters to uh 
you know to sail through and and uh and i'm confident of the uh the wind in the sheets as, as, it, as it were but looking at this and listening to uh richard Sunak give giving uh, uh, paint his vision for fs tell me about what your confidence looks like and your, your excitement levels about seeing the sector and what it means for people within it i think um the future is actually very positive and that and that's not just a sort of natural tendency to be optimistic we are seeing amongst our clients a high level of interest in starting up businesses in London increasing activities in London and particularly uh, from two directions from from EU territories that they're, they're not losing interest at all and particularly the US um, and it's interesting because after the brexit referendum result in June, 2016, which came as quite a shock to quite a few people and the city included. And obviously there was a few weeks where everyone was wondering what quite what that meant. The first uh, sort of new jobs to come through were all from US clients. And they, they were back in there as quick as you like. And it's quite interesting, actually, there's a building around the corner from this office, which was, was, was going up and didn't have any tenants. And people were thinking, well, you know, no one's going to want to, you know, take space in these kinds of places or even buy those buildings. And guess what? very large US house decided not just to rent a floor in that building, they decided to buy the building um, <laughs> to stroke the uh, the London commercial property market, shot up in value because it was an extremely large building. Worth yeah. um, but boy, did that did that cheer everybody up when they did that? Because, you know, if you see Americans piling in, that generally speaking, that you know, they know what they're talking about. They, there's a really well, that's, that's very interesting, isn't it? Because I think they have been pining in. I mean, even even in your your trade, <laughs> oh um, yeah, I've been seeing uh, um, you know, headlines recently, which I'm sure you've, you'd, you'd have seen as well about the sort of American firms and the starting salaries for uh, you know, lawyers shooting up to uh, oh, yeah. you know, <laughs> sig- yeah. significant numbers from some of those yeah. houses in in, in recent uh, in recent times. But I think that's a really positive thing, right? There's a, the, the US is um, is seeing opportunity in, in a uh, in a country there that is that has, that has been robust through a very difficult period and has genuine ambition uh, to you know to, to lead through its position as a fin- in financial services, and that that to me creates a very very exciting future. So I'm I'm pleased that we're in agreement uh, as to uh, as to where you sit with that, um, Duncan. There'll be people here who, who've been uh, I'm sure very interested with what you've you've said so far, and thanks for sharing it in in such detail and throwing light on light, light on the uh, on the speech. So if if they if they're, they're watching this and want to find out a little bit more, what's the best way of getting in touch with you? So if you uh, my firm is called Field Fisher. And if you go on our website, um, which is fieldfisher.com, Field Fisher, all one word, just like Field and Fisher. If you go on our website, my name is Duncan Black, so you'll see my contact details on there. If you do want to get in touch, very happy to have a chat and, and see where we go. We, we do get quite a lot of inquiries, actually. Not all of them go anywhere, but it's quite interesting to watch, to monitor what the passing trade looks like. But, I mean, most of our work comes through recommendation and introduction, as, as that would be true of most professional firms. But we do, get, we do get people off the street, if I can put it that way, and, and a few of them do, do turn out to be you know, mutually beneficial client relationships. Well, I'm sure that people are listening to this and uh, wanting to find out more. So hopefully we can get some mutually uh, beneficial relationships coming from it. Yeah, that'd be great. Duncan, it's been an absolute pleasure. I've really enjoyed the uh, the, the conversation. Uh, it sounds like exciting times for the financial yeah, services sector. I think that's true. And I'm, and I'm sure we will uh, see more of each other in the, in the not too distant future. It'd be great to get your commentary as things continue to develop as well. Thank you for I'd joining like us. Thank very much. Thank you very much. Absolute pleasure. And thank you all for watching. We will see you soon on another episode of Fintech Focus TV. Thanks a lot. 